Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to each one of you who have logged into this uh, training program for LRA professionals. Today, whole day has been dedicated for uh, training various allied health professionals. It is very uh, important to note that the role played by allied health professionals is very, very uh, important. It is recognized and that's the reason we are having uh, these uh, training sessions exclusively for allied health professionals. And uh, here, uh, this is the third program, I'm supposed. Third program being conducted. Morning, you had a program for respiratory care and uh, cardiac care. And now, the training is for optometry, hospital administration, then radiotherapy, public health, and uh, IT and speech, um, speech and uh, audiology. So these are the allied professionals who will be trained. In this hour of crisis, it is imperative and also mandatory that all of us are well versed with the uh, the new pandemic that has uh, gripped the whole world. We should be aware of uh, the manifestations of the disease and also where the way it uh, spreads and the way it can be tackled with. If, as health professionals, it is imperative that we know the details of this uh, disease so that whenever somebody comes across and somebody asks us, we should be in a position to give them authentic information. This is the time when rumors start spreading, fake news start uh, spreading, and our social media is so uh, very active that whatever is uh, you know, spread through social media, people start believing it. So that should not happen. And uh, that calls for getting uh, ourselves updated, getting ourselves uh, knowledgeable about all the uh, aspects of the disease so that we will be in a position to convey the message, correct message, authentic message to all others, be it public or neighbors or even for family members for that matter. That being the case, today we are uh, uh, addressing the training program of uh, allied health professionals. As I mentioned earlier, optometry, hospital administration, public health, radiotherapy and uh, speech and audiology. So I welcome you all and today we have uh, Dr. Uma Shankar and Dr. Babita Rajan who will be addressing you all on various topics and uh, the protocol is like this. There will be a lecture for about uh, one hour and at the end of one hour all of you are uh, uh, you know, permitted to ask questions and clear your doubts and this is the way of training because otherwise it's very difficult to physically uh, you know, bring everybody onto one platform and it is not permissible or permitted also in this hour of lockdown. So training online is the only option that we have, and that's why we have adopted to this. Rajagandhi University of Health Sciences, on behalf of government of Karnataka, has take up this, taken up this uh, humongous task of training every health professional belonging to all segments of uh, the different faculties, and that's the reason uh, this program has been arranged. This is the 13th program that we have uh, airing from uh, the studios of RGHS. And today we have Dr. Uma Shankar from Pradarshri Group of Institutions. He's also a consultant homeopath, as you all know. He'll be talking to us on uh, epidemiology of COVID-19. So without wasting much time, I would request uh, Dr. Uma Shankar to start his lecture. Thank you, sir, for providing us the opportunity to speak on uh, the COVID-19, especially for our allied health professionals. Good afternoon, friends. As uh, Sir told, we have two major important topics which we'll be discussing today. One for all the allied health professionals. Uh, the learning objective for this session, another uh, one hour to 1.5 hours, we'll be talking, discussing on the epidemiology of COVID-19. Then we'll discuss the surveillance of COVID-19 and we'll illustrate the use of PPE for allied health professionals. Describe the process of biomedical waste management and Last one is to discuss the hospital preparedness during COVID-19. So let's understand, we have been talking of Corona. Most of you would have heard in the news and it's been a talk of the town. So what is Corona? Coronavirus are a large family of viruses that cause illness ranging from common cold to more severe diseases such as MERS, or how it's called, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome or Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, what we call it as SARS-CoV-2. And a novel coronavirus is a new strain that has not been previously identified by humans. Now, how did it all start? The origin, somewhere in December 2019, few people from Wuhan started reporting a 
pneumonia kind uh, like sim uh, symptoms and which was unknown origin so they didn't know what is the cause for that that's how it started uh, origin this this disease started so among those who reported initially they found that among the 41 patients 66 per persons as a percent of people had exposure to seafood market so they thought there must be something which is spreading through seafood market which was and we also know similarly we also had earlier sars which also originated from china in november 2002 and that affected around 8000 people plus people and more than 700 deaths in 26 countries now let me quickly go through how the timeline what is happening so it's as i told it started in december 2019 so on exactly on 12th december 2019 wuhan reported the first case of pneumonia like uh, disease then in 31st december chinese authorities alerted who about a case of pneumonia of unknown etiology so on 1st jan wuhan seafood market was closed because they thought it must be coming from the seafood market on 3rd jan who notified all the countries and including india on 7th jan they identified 2019 novel coronavirus on 12th jan Wuhan reported first death. Now on 13th Jan, uh, Thailand confirmed the first case outside China, which demonstrated that the disease started spreading to other countries. On, on 30th Jan, India confirmed its first case and also WHO declared it as public health emergency of international concern on 30th Jan. On 11th February, the virus was renamed as SARS-CoV-2 and disease as COVID-19. On 28th February, uh, looking up all the cases, all the region WHO declared the uh, global risk as very high. On 8th March, as uh, the disease had already spread to more than 102 countries and local transmission to more than 50 countries. On 11th March, WHO declared that COVID-19 was pandemic. As on today, total cases globally, this is as on uh, 14th April uh, data from WHO, which says more than 18 lakh people are totally confirmed cases are there. To be very specific, it is 18 lakh 44,151 and 71,779 total confirmed new cases and we had we have around 1,17,009 total deaths across the globe. One good thing is there is no new country or territory or area reported cases of COVID-19 in the last 24 hours. So when we look at the region wise, WHO region wise, uh, European region has maximum number of cases with more than 9 lakh uh, confirmed cases and around 80,000 deaths. Uh, region of America has confirmed more than uh, 6 lakh cases. Western Pacific region is more than 1 lakh cases. And Eastern Mediterranean region, again, more than 1 lakh. And Southeast Asian region is around 18,000 some uh, confirmed cases. To look at some data on specific countries, if we look at some of the developed countries, United States is the highest, which is confirming around 5,53,822 cases. And total new case is around 29,308. And US again has the maximum number of death of 21,972 as on 14th uh, April. Followed by Spain, which is 1.6 lakhs around, Italy around 1.5 lakhs, and Germany around 1.25 lakhs, and United Kingdom around 88,000 uh, and so. China is stuck uh, somewhere around 83,000. Now, coming to India, as on yesterday, uh, 14th April, the cases 9272 active cases 1189 cases which are cured or discharged and we have around 353 deaths so when we look at uh, the states so as uh, the maharashtra has shown the maximum number both in number of cases and in number of deaths followed by delhi there are some uh, union territories and northeastern states which have not reported any cases as of now. So to be very specific on some numbers, Maharashtra around 2,337 total confirmed cases and 229 cases which are uh, discharged 
and 160 deaths. Delhi with 1510 cases and 28 deaths. So Madhya Pradesh uh, is around 730. The number of deaths are a little higher. It's around 50. Now, when we look at Kerala, the number of cases are 379, which initially, which was the first state to confirm the COVID-19, uh, which has, yeah. as of today, it has 379 cases and three deaths. Karnataka is doing a little better. We have around 258 confirmed cases and nine deaths as of now. So coming to epidemiology of COVID-19, let's understand how, what is the cause. And as I already told before, the agent is coronavirus, which belongs to a large family of RNA virus. Some of these causing illness in people and others circulate among animals, including bats, camels, etc. Rarely animal coronaviruses evolve and infect people and then spreads further through human to human transmission. Something like we had earlier SARS and MERS in 2002, 12, sorry. The etiological agent is responsible for the present outbreak of COVID-19 is SARS-CoV-2, which is a novel coronavirus. And currently, as per the estimate, the incubation period of novel coronavirus 2019 is ranging from 2 to 14 days of mean five days. Now, let's look at the mode of transmission. It's basically a, res a droplet transmission. The respiratory secretion can spread from person to person through droplets. Now, suppose a person sneezes, the infected person sneezes or coughs. So he throws out some droplets, which either through his hand or through the surface, the droplets may fall, fall on the surface and it gets transmitted to other persons. So either infected person coughs, he may on onto the surface or through hand. This is the main mode of transmission. Now, majority of the case arise from close contacts of symptomatic cases. And transmission is in most setting is driven by family clusters. That is those who stay together. That's more than 75 to 85% of the clusters have shown it's by those who are staying very together. The most careful studies of 20 household attack rates that uh, suggested that it was around 10% earlier. And then later on, it fell to 3% when the isolation was done. So these are all uh, reports which is coming from the Chinese uh, and WHO mission uh, report. So the transmission in other closed settings is happening, but not major driver. This was in China. So school and outbreak have not been a feature of this outbreak because mostly schools and colleges have been closed down. Now let's understand the case definition. So severe acute respiratory infection, that's acute respiratory infection with high fever that is the people who are having fever um, or temperature of 38 degrees or more and cough the onset within last 10 days and which require hospitalization however point to be noted here the absence of fever does not exclude the viral infection so now case definitions for surveillance surveillance case definition uh, is these Severe acute respiratory infection in a person with a history of fever and cough uh, requiring admission to hospital. They may have in, uh, with no other etiology with fully explains the clinical presentation or they may have some this one and or some of the following symptoms. That is a history of travel to Wuhan or any uh, high uh, prevalent area. With, uh, within in 14 days prior to symptom of onset or the disease occur in healthcare workers who have been working in an environment where patients with severe acute respiratory infections are being cared for with without regard to place or residence or history of travel or the person develops an unusual or an unexpected clinical course especially the sudden deterioration despite appropriate treatment without regard to place of residence or history of travel. Even if another etiology has been identified that fully explains the clinical presentation. So continued with the severe uh, surveillance case definition. So a person with acute illness of any degree of severity who within 14 days before the onset of illness had any of the following exposures. So this the first one close physical contact with a confirmed case of novel coronavirus infection while that patient was symptomatic or 
maybe a healthcare facility in a country where hospital associated with novel coronavirus infection have been reported. That is where they are treating the patients. Let's look at contact, which is very important. A contact is a person who experienced any of the following exposure during the two days before and 14 days after the onset of symptoms of a probable or confirmed case. So someone who has had a face to face contact with a probable or a confirmed case within one meter and for more than 15 minutes. So that person is supposed to be a contact or a person who has had a direct physical contact with a probable or confirmed case or a person who has who's providing direct care for a patient with a probable or confirmed case a confirmed COVID-19 disease without using proper personal protective equipment or it may be other situation as indicated under local risk assessment. So the situation may vary from uh, region to region or place to place. So according to that, we may have to look at it. So now who is a close contact? We said the close contact. So a close contact is defined as a healthcare associated exposure. The person who is including uh, provide the person who is providing direct care for novel coronavirus patients or somebody who is working within healthcare workers infected with novel coronavirus or when you visit a patient or someone who is staying in the same close environment of a novel coronavirus patient. Next one, somebody who is working together in a close proximity or sharing the same classroom environment with novel coronavirus patient or someone who is traveling with a novel coronavirus patient in any kind of conveyance. It could be bus, it could be train, it could be metro or you're traveling in a closed car or something like that who are traveling very closely together. Or someone who is living in the same household as the uh, patient, that is the novel coronavirus patient. Point to be noted here is the epidemiological link may have occurred within a 14 day period before or after the onset of illness in the case under consideration. So it varies from case to case. So now there are basically two types of contacts. That is one is high risk contact, other one is the low risk contacts. So now who are those who are high risk contacts? The high risk contacts are those people who have touched body fluids of patient, specifically the respiratory tract secretions, blood, vomit, saliva, urine or feces. Or somebody who has had a direct physical contact with the body of the patient, including physical examination without PPE or someone who has touched or cleaned the linens, the cloths or dishes of the patient or someone who is living in the same household as a patient or anyone in a close proximity that is within three feet or one meter of confirmed case without precautions. A passenger in a close proximity within three feet of a conveyance, whichever mode of transport you are using, with a symptomatic person who later tested positive for COVID-19 for more than six hours. Now, let's look at those who are the people who are at low risk. So people who are at low risk are someone who has shared the same space, such as classroom of a school or somebody, your colleague, somebody you're working together or you're staying in the same room or someone which is similar, but not having a high risk exposure to confirm or suspect case of COVID-19. And the other one, the people who have traveled in same environment like bus, train, flight or any mode of transit, but not having a high risk of exposure. So that is they didn't have in contact of someone. Now, when do we have to do the surveillance? What are the key consideration to do the surveillance? The surveillance is a period of this uh, disease is for 28 days, which includes 14 days of quarantine at home or hospital or any designated facility and next 14 days is for self reporting. Now testing all high risk contacts to be tracked, quarantined and lab tested as per the protocol of WHO and Government of India. For those who are at low risk contacts, lab tests have to be done only when the person under surveillance develops symptoms. So till then they should be under quarantine and observation. So what do we do there? We take a sample of throat swab nasopharyngeal swab which uh, details already we had discussed where how to do what to do and all in the lab session so here we are not going to discuss that in detail so treatment is basically symptomatic management 
and as you all know there is no drugs or vaccine recommended at present now for surveillance those who are indian nationals irrespective of location of their healthcare facility where whether the suspected or confirmed case is admitted it will be included in the line list of the state where the case is residing that is during the 14 days last 14 days time period either they had prior or after the onset of symptoms now in case of any conflict now the states may discuss the matter amongst themselves and take a decision now foreign for those foreign nationals an individual or a group of foreign national if found positive and admitted in a designated health facility in a particular state the state to include such foreigners in its line list now let's look at community based surveillance because some of you are public health people or hospital administration people who may take up this uh, activity uh, in future if uh, need may arise so now surveillance is done by visiting the local residence of the contact or contacts by health personnel may be used in certain circumstances for follow up either you may contact in person or you may use telephonic con contact so when you go such things what when you do a surveillance introduce yourself explain the purpose of surveillance collect the data in a prescribed format of the government of india and those contacts of confirmed cases traced and has to be monitored daily for at least 28 days after the last exposure to the case uh, patient for the evidence of covid-19 symptoms as per the definition which we saw earlier now information about the contacts can be obtained from when you are talking either to by the to the patient directly or to his or her family members or persons at patients workplace or schools associates friends colleagues whomever has been a close contact or with the knowledge of patients recent activities and travel now suppose if you find or if uh, the advisory for contacts is if the contact is asymptomatic he has to be home quarantine for 14 days for the uh, from the last exposure and he should initiate a self health monitoring for development you have to observe whether they are developing any symptoms such as cough or cold or a fever or something like that or active monitoring daily visit has to be done either by in person or by phone calls for 28 days that is after their last exposure shall be uh, uh, of the covid okay and all this has to be done by the covid warriors some of you have already registered i suppose now and you also have to have a direct and high risk contacts of confirmed cases should be tested once between day 5 and day 14 for coming uh, to his or her contact now if they are symptomatic or if the contacts are symptomatic which they are presenting symptoms of fever cough or difficulty in breathing the first thing should advise them to use mask and self isolate them and immediately you should inform the concerned authorities I, I either uh, to the covid warriors or the anm asha or the nearest phcs and the local health official either by phone or in person whatever may be the case all the contact tracing has to be done this is very important a positive case may have contact uh, in multiple district or in states so because people are moving even after lockdown so they may have contacts with others so tracking of all these contacts located in a particular district or a state will be the responsibility of the respective district or the state health authorities in case of any high risk contact found in a particular district sampling to be carried out by the district authorities along with home or hospital quarantine for the said contact that is now a sampling has to be carried out strictly in accordance with the guidelines so guidelines is given by the government of india so now especially for those who are symptomatic suspects or high risk contacts we need to contact now what is contact tracing when we do a contact tracing you have to identify all the infected patient and record their names or the suspected the names the contact uh, information of the particular person all the demographic information the date of the first and the last exposure or date of contact with a confirmed or probable case so that you can trace back now and 
date of onset when the fever or respiratory symptoms developed so now from one person it could spread to multiple people so if suppose you can see in the image you have a person who is infected he may have contacted with somebody whom he doesn't know or he may have contacted someone whom he knows but who is not infected so a common exposure and type of contact with confirmed or suspected cases should be thoroughly documented for any contacts that become infected. Now contact tracing just for understanding. So somebody who has traveled from abroad and come here, they must have gone to their home. So those people are uh, primary contacts. They would have contact them or somebody who is staying nearby is the local transmission. And then or if they are from them, they would spread to others. So those are secondary uh, contacts. And then from those secondary contacts, it may go into tertiary contact. So that is on local transmission, which happens. Now, safety precautions, if you are going for surveillance, for contact tracing, uh, then the healthcare staff should maintain one meter, at least minimum of one meter distance from the contact. Should use a mask, as uh, which will be discussed later in the next session. The mask should be owned by the contact tracing team. Personal protective equipment as per requirement and maintain infection protection and control and hand washing. All these things will be dealt in next session in detail. Now suppose you identify a case or identify in the community. You identify all the contacts, monitor them for 14 days from a time of exposure of the case. If no symptoms, then the monitor can stop. Now it is advised to still even continue for 24, 20, uh, another 14 days up to 28 days. So if symptoms are there, you have to identify their contacts and monitor them for 14 days and repeat this contact tracing cycle until no new cases are there. Now, I, if symptoms are there, isolate them and test them and treat them for novel coronavirus. So if once you isolate them and test them, if they have two negative tests, then the monitoring can stop. OK, if they have positive tests, then again, you have to isolate them and treat them. Now, suppose you find though in a healthcare facility, similarly identify the contact, monitor them for 14 days from the time of exposure. Now you should test all the healthcare workers who were in contact of this patient, regardless whether they have developed the symptoms or not developed the symptoms. And if positive, then isolate them and check them for two consecutive uh, negative should be tested. If they, they show some kind of a symptoms, then again, contact tracing of all the contacts have to be done, monitor them for 14 days, and this patient has to be isolated and treated for novel coronavirus. Again, check for two negative tests, and then we can stop the monitoring. Now, cluster containment. What is the containment strategy? Very quickly, I'll just go through. So the, what the government of India is thinking, the scenarios is, travel related to cases which are reported in India or local transmission of COVID-19 with single clusters because they're all close contact or the large outbreaks of COVID-19 disease if multiple contacts they may spread across or maybe India becomes epidemic uh, or endemic for COVID-19. So it is the IDSP the, will be involved in community surveillance in all of the above case scenarios. So what is the containment zone? So containment zone is defined where the index case or a cluster which will be designated epicenter or you will have a geographical distribution of cases around that epicenter and local administrative boundaries of the either urban cities or a town. A scenario may be a, a case based scenario will be their approach like you may have a small cluster in a close environment or a single cluster in a residential colony where while deciding the perimeter of the containment zone. So now this decision is based on the decision of perimeter of containment zone is to be guided by continuous real time risk assessment based on what are the data coming based on that the, the perimeter will be decided. So we have to maintain a strict perimeter uh, control for this uh, containment of COVID-19. So the perimeter control is primary and administrative measure. So that's what we are talking about distancing and all. Enhanced surveillance within perimeter is a part of a larger administrative response. So now the rapid response team will be oriented about how to, what uh, surveillance has to be done, how contact tracing has to be done and all. So now 
the buffer zone and the containment zone if you see that the red dots that is the positive so then the uh, the containment area is the yellow ones and the purple color is the buffer zone so buffer zone is an area around the containment zone where the new cases most likely to appear because they are very close so there will not be any perimeter control for the buffer zone so administrative measures within the perimeter area during containment is we have to refrain from uh, leaving their homes people should not come out and moving around from the containment zone for at least 14 days so we should refrain from participating in any events either indoor or outdoor uh, venues when you have uh, any kind of symptoms which is uh, either fever or any respiratory symptoms which are detected so employers to cooperate for leaves or absence within the written diagnosis enhanced entry screening for travelers from containment zone involvement we should involve all the concerned department for containment now very quickly let me come to the what are the signs and symptoms from the report of who china joint mission so uh, more than 72,000 cases they observed and they found out that fever was the most common symptom fever cough fatigue shortness of breath these were the major symptoms and there were also symptoms of skin rashes which some of them have reported so the pattern of the disease mostly they were mild cases to moderate cases and most of them recovered and very few of them had severe to critical illness and some of them uh, even those who have severe or critical illness recovered so they had uh, just required hospitalization or isolation uh, when we look at the severity of illness most of them who had severe illness were who had comorbidities that is they had either the diabetes hypertension or any other uh, diseases such as cancer or something and those who did not have comorbidity only so 26 percent of them had the severe illness so among those 72,000 odd cases majority of them had mild or self-limiting illness that's around 81 percent and only 15 percent required hospitalization and those only four percent required ventilator support and these are the references now i would request uh, our next uh, speaker dr babita to take over exhaustive uh, presentation on epidemiology of uh, covid 19. thank you dr omar shankar uh, we move on to Dr. Bhavita Rajan. She would be speaking on personal protective equipments, hand wash, and biomedical waste management. We just now saw her washing her hands using the alcohol uh, uh, present here. And that's the practice, I think, probably very important in these days. Again, uh, over to Dr. Bhavita Rajan for uh, taking us through the personal protective equipments and uh, biomedical waste management. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, I'm sure this seems to be a very simple topic. But just uh, for this pandemic, I think this is the biggest concern for every single person, person right from the health personnel to the common person, layman in the house. So let's deal with the personal protective equipment. The reason why we are talking about it is this, we don't want it to be wasted. We want PP to be reaching to the right set of people as well as there should be a rationalized uh, reason to use PP. So why do you think we need to use this? One is to protect ourselves. Second is to prevent spread of infection to others. Before wearing PPE, I'm sure everyone will be, you'll have to remember that you have to remove the utens, uh, your jewelries, your watches, and before donning in the PPE, make sure you have your meal, drink water, and use the washroom before donning PPE. Remember, there should be a separate designated room for donning and doffing of your PP. Always perform hand hygiene before donning and after doffing of PP. So, uh, you know, you're very well aware of the hand washing step. So, here I have an alcohol, alcohol sanitizer. So, make sure I just take with two pushes and apply on the palmer surface and then on the dorsum surface of my palm, both the palms, and then interlace between my fingers, back to the fingers. Make sure that you go around the thumb and then over the palm of both the hand, rinse it with water if you're using soap and then dry it thoroughly. If you're using close the faucet with the towel and your hands are safe. Let's talk about the mask. 
Why should we use mask? One is to protect the airway from the particular matter that's generated by as uh, droplets or aerosols, which prevents human infection. Second is to prevent spread of infection to others. The different types of masks. One such as N95. I'm sure you, you're aware of this mask and most important is the health frontline workers who really require this at the triage area, at the screening area, lab technicians, flu clinic, ICU, isolation area, sanitary staff, person handling the biomedical waste management and handling dead bodies. Even in the respiratory care unit, if at all they're coming direct patient contact, a cardiac care unit also. How to wear an N95 mask? Remember, you just have to first, when you get a cup, the mask, you have to cup in front of the mask. Once you position the mask, make sure it leans over the chin and on the no bridge of the nose. So your two headbands will be hanging in front. The first one, pull it over the head and place it around the crown. The second lower band, pull it above your head and below your neck behind the ear. Now, how do you check it is fitting properly or not? Blow or forcibly exhale through the mask. Make sure there's no air leakage. If at all there's an air leakage, make sure that you tighten the bridge of the nose and also the sides by adjusting the elastic band. Now coming to a surgical mask, where do you use this? We use it at the OPD wings, OPD areas, radiology wing. Lab technician only goes for drawing blood for any other investigation. Ambulance driver and cleaner. Healthcare staff at quarantine, that is who are monitoring and test temperature recording. Support staff at quarantine centers. Now how do you wear the surgical mask? It's a very simple one. You know you have a two colored side. One, the color side, you face it outside and the white side facing inside, making sure once you place your loops around the elastic loop over the ear, you fit it snugly over the making adjustment over the bridge of the nose. This is how you check for the fit of the mask. Cloth mask, which most of us are using these days, as we all know, there is shortage of uh, PPE or the surgical mask and N95 are being used by the wrong set of people too. So cloth mask is preferable for those people who are not in contact with directly with the patients. So like clinical researchers, administrative employees, community settings. Uh, two sets of uh, two sets can be there and not to be shared by any person. Make sure you, once you use it, wash it with hot water, dry it, that is sun dry. Uh, remember when uh, in contact tracing, as mentioned by Dr. Omar Shankar, uh, we use we are supposed to be using N95 as well as or a surgical mask preferably. Try avoiding uh, con uh, cloth mask because these are the areas where you'll be tracing for the contacts. Okay. So wearing a cloth mask is very simple. The topmost uh, lace is to be tied over the crown of the head. The bottom one to be tied below the neck and behind the ear. In the picture you can see it is front of the ear, but this will actually lead to a slightly loose mask. So in order to make it fit and tight, put it behind the ear. Talking about the gloves, we are aware of there is two types, surgical as well as heavy duty gloves. Let's talk about the surgical gloves. People who deal with COVID-19 patients or suspects like sample collection or transportation, testing the sample, people who work in the respiratory care unit, cardiac care unit, dialysis, ICU, radiology unit, even radiotherapy. Even during a contact tracing, you never know where do you actually touch which part of the building or rails, you know, preferably let them also wear the gloves. Donning of the gloves, as you're aware, first thing we have to check the package, see if there is any damage in it. If it is ambidextrous, can be worn in neither hand. If at all, if not, just make sure that right uh, thumbs are going and fitting into the proper gloves. Docking of gloves, always pinch and hold the outside of the glove near the wrist area. Feel it skewered downwards away from the wrist, turning the glove inside out. Pull the glove away until it is removed from the hand, which is which means you're holding the inside out glove with the gloved hand. Now, with your ungloved hand, sliding your finger under the wrist of the remaining glove, do not touch the outer surface of the glove. Peel downwards away from the wrist, turning the glove inside out. Continue to pull the glove down and over the inside out glove being held in your gloved hand. Make sure you discard the gloves into the red bin. So looking at the slide, you have these are the uh, particular 
gears which are there in the personal protection equipment package. One, you will have the surgical mask, the nose, uh, the uh, N95 mask, face shield, goggle, the gown, apron, two sets of two pairs of gloves, head cover, and shoe cover. I will be showing the videos of donning and doffing at the end. Before the after, just now, now we'll just go through our biomedical waste management. We'll just take two minutes for you to just understand the process of how you will discard the PPE. Remember, when you get the PPE package, that's a kit, which comes with all your gears, it also consists of a red liner for disposal. Uh, most, some of the places where they use entire PPE is being discarded into red liner, but as per the CPCB, that is Central Pollution Control Board, it would be preferable to dispose the plastics and recyclable and the rubber gloves into the red liner. Not to forget hand wash before donning and after doffing of the PPE. Where well, is the point of generation of biomedical waste? One, we have labs, flu clinic, isolation ward, quarantine center, operation theater, ICU, respiratory care unit, cardiac care unit, and dialysis unit. And people who come back from the contact tracing, please discard into the nearby uh, PHC or urban health center, which is there into the, uh, the gloves to be discarded into the red and remaining a mask to be discarded into the yellow. If it is a surgical mask, please discard into yellow. N95, I'm sure you won't be having a complete contact and not for more number of hours. You can reuse after drying it for four days, making sure that you have that many number of N95. As per biomedical waste management rule 2016, which has been amended over few for the past few years, uh, all the lab waste, infected waste goes into the yellow bin and that bin should be labeled COVID-19. So you, what all goes in surgical mask, the shoe cover, and then your PP, that is your gown, your hood, and all. So as per the current 2020 BMW rules for COVID, they have mentioned that use of double yellow liners and labeled COVID-19. Segregation as per rules, which has been practiced from past so many years, so that there won't be any disorientation among these staffs who are performing this part. Autoclave the lab waste. Now, coming to the red uh, bin, it should all be, also be marked as COVID-19. What goes into it? Gloves, goggles, face sheet, and recyclable plastics. Again here, it's double red liners, put operated bin, labeled COVID-19, and it should be autoclaved. Coming to the white puncture-proof, tamper-proof container, if it is that kind of container, which is meant for needles, just label it as COVID-19. If not, if it is some other container where it is easy to uh, open and tamper, it is not tamper proof, you will have to fill it up with three fourth with disinfectant and then discard the needles into it. Talking about the blue bin, it should, uh, some hospital will be practicing in a cardboard box, but preferably we would like them to use a double liner in the cardboard box or a puncture proof container, which is painted blue, mark it before Glass slides and broken glass can be put into it. Use if you are using liner, please use double liner, but label it as COVID-19. Speed management, continue the same process of how you have been practicing in your hospital with full PPE. So you know how it goes, quadrant the area where the PPE, take away the spill with the help of a mop or a paper, whatever it is, discard it to the yellow bin, Use a disinfectant, again, mop it up and discard into a yellow bin. So before I go to the videos, I would like to just recap what I've completed so far. Remember the three D. D is for donning, D is for doffing and in a designated room. Full PP should be used in screening OPD, laboratory, dealing with samples, COVID ward where doctors or nurses, ICU, when you do procedures, making sure you reduce the aerosolized procedures. Doctors and nurses who are transporting the COVID patients from the ambulance, the dialysis unit, OT, performing autopsy. So these are the people who are required full PPE. N95 masks and gloves, OPD areas, radiology wing, laundry and transport of COVID patient, healthcare staff at the quarantine facility, clinical examination. Who is actually doing clinical examination. When do you use surgical masks and gloves, people who are at the inquiry desk, or the health monitoring, who does this monitoring and temperature recording, support staff at the quarantine facility and ambulance driver. A surgical mask and heavy duty gloves, 
OPD cleaning staff and ambulance cleaner. Administrative employees assigned as our office staffs, no PPE required. When they go out, preferable let them wear the cloth mask. So this is the order of donning uh, of PPE, wear the shoe cover, wear the uh, uh, gown, mask, and then wear the hood. Then you wear the goggles, face shield, and the gloves. So here I have not shown you the two pairs of gloves, but in the starting, you wear the gloves and the end. The reason why we have put up this session is one, to understand where do we use this PPE, at which area, we should rationalize our use of PPE, do not misuse it. And remember, the take home message for you all is social distancing, wear masks where needed, and sanitize. So safeguard your biomedical waste management. Segregate according to BMW rules. Use double liners to be used for bins. Disinfect or autoclave the waste at the site. Label the bags of COVID-19. Maintain separate register for COVID-19 waste. Wear appropriate PPE while handling waste and hand hygiene. Now let's go through the videos of donning and doffing and the videos where we use PPE in different areas of hospital. Namaste. We from Ames, New Delhi would like to demonstrate the donning and doffing methods in easy steps for protection of our healthcare workers working in COVID designated areas. Donning or wearing of the personal protective equipment must be performed outside the COVID ward in the donning designated area. The healthcare worker must be prepared for the shift duty by taking a meal, using the washroom and drinking water prior to entering the donning area. Remove all accessories like jewelry, wallet, watches, mobile phones, etc. and change into clean hospital scrubs and wear closed washable footwear. Wash your hands thoroughly with soap and water. Now perform hand hygiene. Sit on a clean chair. Tie the straps just below the knee by adjusting the length according to your height and make a simple bow like knot which is not too tight, not too loose so that it is easy to open while doffing later. Now wear the first set of gloves, which are an adequate fit to your hands. Examine the gown for any damage, including tears. Begin with wearing the arm sleeves, covering the inner gloves at the wrist. Wrap the gown leaving no area exposed even at the back. You may take the help of your buddy. As a small trick to cover the exposed part of your neck, we suggest wearing an impermeable disposable uti tal around the neck to cover the neck and the shoulders. Hold the N95 mask like a cup in your hand with both the straps hanging out in the front. Place the mask on your face. 
pull and wear the lower strap first placing it below your ears then pull and wear the upper strap placing it above the ears the most important step is to check that there should not be more than minimal air leakage around the mask when forcibly exhaling wear the eye goggles and ensure the fit if a face shield is available it should be worn after donning the hood Wear the hood by crossing over the broad straps and tie them behind the neck. Make sure that the knot is easy to open at the time of doffing. Wear the second pair of gloves. Pull them to cover the sleeve cuff and forearms as much as possible. Check the fit of the gown and be comfortable in moving around. Now you're ready to move into the covid area. Doffing or taking off the PPE must be done in a designated doffing area having red biomedical waste bins. labeled separately for each type of personal protective equipment there should be two chairs labeled as clean and dirty preferably made of plastic or metal which are easy to disinfect it is very essential to perform each step with utmost care and slowly so as to not generate any aerosol perform hand hygiene after each step Take the help of the observer to check for any air leaks or tears in the PPE. During the entire doffing procedure, the observer must not touch your PPE. Inspect for any gross contamination. Which could be disinfected with alcohol-based wipes. Now first disinfect your gloves with alcohol based hand rubs it should be ideally be dispensed from an automated system or with the help of your buddy or by pressing the nozzle with your elbow to prevent contamination Now sit on the dirty chair with legs apart remove the shoe covers by opening the straps Slowly pull the shoe cover from the outside surface starting from the top and then pull from the toes end. Try not to cross over your legs while sitting. Discard the shoe covers in the red bin. Uh, kindly mute your microphone. please kindly uh, mute your microphones so humble request to all the audience or participants who are online kindly mute your microphone kali class start aa gaya Now disinfect the outer gloves. Oh, 
bây giờ Pinch the first glove on the outer surface at the wrist and pull it inside out. Hold this glove in the other hand like a ball. Now slide your thumb inside the other glove and remove it inside out, balling around the previous glove, making it into a single bag. Discard them in the red bin. Now disinfect your inner gloves. To remove the hood, open the ties from behind the neck. And stoop forward towards the bin. Pull out the hood from the top and discard. Again, you need to disinfect your inner gloves. Now slowly remove the disposable OT towel around your neck, carefully from one side to other in a rolling motion discard the ot towel disinfect your inner gloves again now untie the gown from behind the neck and from behind the waist Carefully untie the straps. Pull the gown near the arms, slightly to slide off the. Now pull the gown from the front of the waist. Carefully pull out the arms by rolling out the sleeves inside out. Fold or roll the gown in such a way that the contaminated surface is not exposed. Discard carefully. Now again, disinfect your inner gloves. To remove the eye goggles, stoop forwards and pull the strap from behind of the head and discard in the labeled bin. Do not touch the front of the goggles. Again, disinfect your inner gloves. Carefully remove the inner pair of gloves as previously described. Now perform hand hygiene with all the steps as mentioned previously. You need to wear a new pair of gloves before removing your mask. These gloves may be sterile or unsterile. Do not touch the exposed surface of the mask. Stoop forwards and first remove the lower strap. Then carefully remove the mask by pulling out the upper strap. Now 
korban gitu ya disinfect your gloves jangan kutip oh berat inspect yourself for any leftover pp left to doff and remove and discard the same for example like your head cap now disinfect your gloves Sit on the clean chair using alcohol wipes. Clean the outer surface of your shoes. Now disinfect your gloves. Remove the last pair of your gloves. Perform hand hygiene. Now you are ready to exit the doffing area. Wipe your shoes on sodium hypochlorite soaked door mat and exit. Protecting our healthcare worker is very very important in this times of COVID-19. To protect them, personal protection equipment or PPE is an important component of the protection gear that we that they have to use however it is important to understand that ppe is a broad term and there are different types of ppe and that is what needs to be understood what is the ideal ppe that has to be worn in different areas you are at the forefront saving lives giving your proximity to severely ill patients you are at a greater risk of infection therefore taking appropriate safety measures such as rational use of personal protective equipment based on guidance by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare is imperative. Equally vital for ensuring your safety and that of patients is infection prevention and control. This ensures that hospitals don't become amplifiers of infection. And for my protection I need N95 mask, goggles, two pair of gloves and a fluid resistant gown I have been posted for the screening area of the suspected covid patients I will be collecting the samples of these patients and for my safety I require the following personal protective equipment which are shoe cover N95 mask, goggles, two pair of gloves, water resistant gown, and a face hood for covering my head and neck. While dealing with the sample of uh, COVID, COVID patients, I need these uh, things for my uh, safety. One is a triple layer mask, then goggles, a pair of gloves, and a gown. 
while dealing with the respiratory samples instead of this uh, triple layer mask and be using an N95 mask. I would be treating the patients of COVID-19 in the ICU. So the things which I would require for my own protection, these are basically the two double gloves, the shoe covers, the inner gown. We would also require a water resistant gown to wear over the inner gown. This is a water resistant gown which would be here. I would require N95 mask. And along with that, I would require a face shield and a hood to cover my head and neck. But in case my face shield and hood is not available, then I would require a goggle to cover my eyes and a separate face shield along with a cap to cover my head. So these things are essential while treating a patient with COVID-19. मुझे अपनी सुरक्षा के लिए सुगवर चाहिए, तंबूर चाहिए, N95 मास्क, फिर बाउं, सर्जिकल ग्लव्स, रेड ड्यूटी ग्लव्स, बुद्ध, अगर बुद्ध नहीं है तो मैं क्या कराऊंगा? गोवर्स लगाऊंगा, सील, उसके बाद प्लास्टिक एफएम कर दूँ। माय प्रोडक्शन, आई वुड बाय शू कवर्स I will require N95 mask. I will require water resistant gown. I will also require double gloves. I will also require hood. If the hood is not there, I will require goggles. For my protection, I need a triple layer mask. For my protection, I need a triple layer mask. For my protection, I need a triple layer mask. For my protection, I need a triple layer mask. For my protection, I need N95 mask, I need a goggles, I need a water resistant gown and a double pair of gloves. I need to surgical masks and heavy duty gloves for my protection. मैंने अपनी सुरक्षा के लिए सर्जिकल मास्क पहनना है। For administrative areas and offices, no personal protective equipment is required. As we face an increasing number of COVID patients in our hospitals. It becomes very important that we rationalize the use of personal protective equipment. This will ensure that the PPE are available for those healthcare workers who really need it when they care for these very sick patients. Use PPE is when needed and use the type of PPE which will give you the best protection but don't misuse it.
so now you have seen both the videos i'm sure that by now you are aware of how to wear how to take off the pp and when to use them um, it's basically to make sure that the people who are in front line really get the pp and uh, not misuse them use a cloth mask if you are at all you are very concerned because there is dirt in certain resources which we are trying to which our government is trying to manage with the supply and demand thank you all hope this session was useful good afternoon everyone so now uh, this part of the session is basically about uh, hospital preparedness during covid-19 most of you may be working in one or the other hospital or you will come across uh, 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 in future may be required uh, all the hospitals will be roped in so hospital preparedness uh, hospitals play a very critical role within the health system in providing essential medical care to patients especially during uh, pandemic such as covid-19 now there is a lot of progressive spread is happening with rapidly increasing service there is a lot of demand for hospitals that can care uh, can can potentially overwhelm the capacity of hospitals to enhance the readiness of the health facilities to cope with the challenges and outbreak or uh, such as a pandemic such as covid-19 or other any other emergency or disaster uh, as hospital managers or people who are working in hospital needs uh, initial general uh, initial of relevant generic priority action we need to take now government of india has uh, uh, made three levels uh, of facilities they have suggested three levels of facilities uh, it may be covid care center or dedicated covid health care center or dedicated covid hospitals uh, you may be coming across uh, or working in any of these three situations so covid care centers are basically uh, those centers which cater to mild or very mild cases of covid suspects or dedicated health care center or health center is dedicated to hospitals that shall offer care for all cases that have been clinically assigned as moderate and then you have dedicated covid hospitals these hospitals shall take or offer comprehensive care for primarily those who are severe cases so you may work in any of these hospitals or you may be working in future so now these hospitals are usually a complex and vulnerable institution because they are depend on a uh, crucial either external support or supply lines so because if you do not have any supplies then you may not be able to cater to situation like this so a well established partnership with local authorities service providers such as water power means of communication or your vendors for various transportation companies or even supplies you need to have a partnership so that you have uninterrupted supply of all these items during current outbreak of covid-19 you need to have a, a uninterrupted supply of the uh, critical support services and supplies would potentially uh, disrupt the provision of acute health care if you do not have the supply so now as hospital administrators or people who are working in hospital we have to ensure that there is continuity of essential services should not stop shut down the hospital should have a well coordinated implementation for priority action and that is within all the stakeholders you should have a good coordination for taking care of covid managing covid uh, 19 or you should have clear and accurate internal and external communication this is very very important and swift adaptation to increase demand as the demand is increasing we should be able to adapt to the situation we should use because the demand will be high we should use the resources very carefully because resources are very scarce should have a safe environment for health workers now for uh, hospital to be ready in such situations the who recommends a uh, incident management system so the components of these are you should have a good communication continuity of essential services and patient care surge capacity we will discuss all these things then human resources logistic management and supplies which includes pharmaceuticals then essential support services infection prevention control case management surveillance and early warning and monitoring and laboratory service we will look at one by one and what is our role in each of these areas now 
whether you have an incident management system or a committee if you do not have a plan i think uh, it's you should uh, either if you already have it you should activate it if you do not have at least have an ad hoc inc uh, incident management system now any designate uh, hospital emergency operation center or any of those three uh, hospital types which we saw a specific location you should either prepare to convene or coordinate a hospital wide emergency response activities equipped well for functioning for uh, all these situation now for each of this area it is always better to have a leader designate a lead person for all each of the component whatever we saw in that list now it's always uh, better you appoint somebody uh, who if somebody is not there in position so that you can guarantee the continuity for decision making especially during this kind of situation leadership is very very important in each department not only in the hospital at a higher level but at each department you need to have a good leadership so that you can take decisions and things can happen smoothly or made smoothly to ensure effective and efficient hospital management for to face the covid-19 outbreak you should have a uh, consult a core internal and external documents related to management of covid-19 so uh, as of now we should all follow what the who guidelines are or the government of india guidelines are now who can be in this incident man, uh, management committee or a group so you can have the hospital administrators especially the directors or nursing director or a ceo you can have medical personnel uh, or the nursing personnel intensive care internal medicine pediatrics or infection control and prevention people the respiratory therapy human resources security pharmaceutical clinical engineering and maintenance because you may have a lot of uh, issues which comes uh, in between or laboratory services dietary services laundry cleaning waste management and supply department so you can have members from all these department to have a, so that you can have a coordinated committee now the search capacity is very important we should understand what is search capacity a search capacity in a hospital that is its ability of a health service to expand beyond its normal capacity to meet and increase demand for clinical care now situation like this as covid 19 the cases may arise or it may increase rapidly so you should the healthcare facility should be able to cater to this demand so that is what the search capacity so how do we know we should know what is our maximum capacity uh, the hospital admission what is the number of bed total number of bed we have we should not only depend on number of beds we should also look at what human resources we have and we should adapt according to that maybe especially in care of critical care isolation cohort or where whether you have mechanical ventilators or any other resources what we have we should all uh, estimate the uh, or preempt increase in demand of hospital services we should identify uh, how the expanding uh, hospital inpatient capacity how you can increase the capacity if need arise uh maybe physical space maybe you have to uh, appoint more staff or rearrange the staff supplies and processes we should as a hospital administration we should always check identify what are the potential gaps in provision of healthcare where the special emphasis here should be for critical care because you should you are addressing something which is emergency now there can uh, if you do not have uh, enough people maybe you may have to outsource some of the care if possible there are various options and try to cancel all non essential services uh, such as elective surgeries whenever necessary you can adapt admission and discharge criteria to prioritize the patient so we should look at at this kind of emergency situation who should be admitted who should not be admitted now the next important area in hospital administration is looking at the infection prevention control uh, we should ensure that all healthcare workers patients the visitors are aware of respiratory and hand hygiene and prevention this is very very important if it is not available uh, try to provide uh, the masks or hand hygiene uh, facilities either to wash the hands or alcohol based hand rub should be installed in every place possible ensure that all the healthcare workers apply all standard precautions for all patients now uh, when we admit a patient 
especially when we are looking at infection prevention and control, patients should be placed in a ventilated single room as far as possible. If single rooms are not available, uh, patients who are suspected to having COVID-19 should be grouped together and they should not be mixed with confirmed cases and uh, suspected cases and those who have come for some other case. So always have uh, try to separate them. At least when you're bringing people together in one particular place, ensure that at least there is a one meter distance between the beds, regardless of whether the patient are suspected or they are having COVID-19. So it's all it's uh, advised to have them separately. But even if you have separately, then have one meter distance of each bed. Ensure that all equipments uh, you better use a single use disposable. If you have to use some of the equipments for multiple patients, then ensure that you clean and disinfect between each and every patient using the cons uh, respective disinfectant. Routinely clean and disinfect surface and wherever the patient is in contact. Now we should ensure that all the healthcare uh, workers are applying or they are using uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, especially all the healthcare workers where they are where in close contact with the uh, patient. Wherever possible, uh, designate healthcare workers separately for those who are working for suspected cases and those who are working for uh, confirmed cases so that you don't have a risk transmission. Among those, uh, they may, uh, what do you call, the situation may arise that they may need some kind of investigations uh, like x-ray and all, uh, use as far as possible portable, not to shift the patient unnecessarily. If required, you need to take care of the uh, prevention of spread of the disease. Maintain all records of persons who are entering the room or exiting the room, especially the staff. And if uh, generally we should not advise, uh, allow any visitors, but if visitors are allowed sometimes, then you need to record who is there now. So you should manage the laboratory specimens, laundry, utensils, everything, and according to the uh, infection prevention control guidelines provided by the WHO and Government of India. Now, case management, whenever we are doing, uh, uh, the medical people will be managing them clinically, but as, uh, as a hospital, we need to be prepared. We should ensure that mechanism is in place, especially for triaging. We should recognize people early. We should see that we control. We should uh, the, uh, control the spread. So better to isolate patients with suspected COVID-19. And we should establish a well-equipped triage station, especially at the entrance of the healthcare facility itself, with uh, supported uh, trained staff. All staff should be trained in their respective areas. Designate an exclusive waiting area for patients and for examination area for individuals who are presenting uh, respiratory symptoms or uh, any kind of fever. We have to ensure, again, this is very important, that all uh, healthcare personnel should use PPE. Ensure application of standard and droplet precaution at all times. Uh, ensure that availability of staff beds for, uh, staff beds for admission for severe COVID-19. We should also ensure that you have enough supply of oxygen, uh, respiratory support, and everything which is uh, specially required for the management of cases. Now, coming to human resources, the human resource uh, department should update the staff contact list because you never know when you need uh, which kind of staff and who is on leave, whether somebody has gone on deputation somewhere or something like that. So you should update your list and ensure that you have a clear policy to monitor and manage the staff uh, who are suspected or who are confirmed of having COVID-19. Whoever has had exposure or who have probable suspect need to be taken care of, especially those who are working in these areas. So it's uh, for each unit in your hospital should identify the minimum number of healthcare workers who should be there so that the infection care should not be spread to others. And other hospital staff need to ensure that sufficient operation of other uh, the unit of services happening. We should prioritize the staff need to specific unit. Okay, distribute it accordingly. Wherever there is demand is more, uh, depute the staffs there more. The staff should familiarize uh, with the uh, the ward staff. 
because there is a high demand in area, especially uh, in where infectious disease wards or emergency or intensive care units to support this search. Provide uh, training for all the staff, exercise uh, uh, relevant uh, wherever it is needed, should provide training, which includes infection prevention, control, clinical management, or ensure that staff has the competency and they have safety measures. Now this, uh, the last point is also very important because staff are a very important resource. It's a scarce report resource. So identify their domestic support measures. For example, if they have to travel, you need to provide travel or uh, some other facilities. Some may, uh, uh, may not, they may stay in very far. So try to provide them some kind of an accommodation somewhere which is very close to hospital or within the hospital premises. So that uh, this uh, domestic support measure is very, very important so that you can enhance the staff flexibility for shift work and they because they have to work long hours at this particular time and give them enough breaks also. Ensure that uh, we have to ensure that uh, the availability of services, especially uh, multidisciplinary, uh, provide them psychosocial support team for families of staff and patients because uh, uh, you all might have seen there are so much videos which are going around which is very emotional. So at that time you need to provide your staff psychosocial support, including provide them access to social workers and counselors. Uh, sometimes you may have to re consider reassigning staff at high risk for complications of COVID and acute respiratory infection. Again, uh, you should prioritize your staff and address all the liabilities for them, provide them insurance, temporary licensing, wherever you may have to need them uh, for any kind of use, any kind of equipments if licensing are required and uh, who are working outside of their area of expertise. Now, if staffs are not there, enough sufficient staffs are not there, recruit them or train the existing staff if they need to, according to the need. Now, we, the, as a hospital, we should ensure that the essential healthcare services and patient care are continuing. So the WHO recommends that we should list all the services what we are providing and especially in priority. So pro, list all of them and see which are the areas you have to provide uh, care that prioritization has to be done. We need to identify and maintain all the services that each hospital is providing and any under circumstances what you're providing or you may have to modify it as the demand is there. We should be prepared across the healthcare facilities. We may have network of hospital or we may have rural centers or anything for any kind of the search or disasters or uh, any kind of emergency situation like COVID. We should identify all the human resources we should identify the logistics which are needed to ensure the continuity of care, especially the other patient services. Now, we, as a hospital, we also need to have some kind of a surveillance and early warning. This is very important because only through surveillance we will know that how the case is, the surge of the case and what is changing in the community or nearby. So we can expect what kind of cases we may get, what is the number or something like that. So for this surveillance, the healthcare workers should recognize and uh, especially the public health people uh, who are involved or who are involved in uh, these kind of uh, surveillance, you need to have them in your hospital. So healthcare workers uh, recognizing and immediately reporting unusual health occurring in the healthcare facilities are very, very important. And they, based on the unusual occurrence or early warning, uh, we need to decide in what kind of facilities, either laboratory or uh, the, the clinical care situation we need to look into. So what we, the, uh, we have to do is we should appoint a public health person or a hospital ep epidemiologist with they should have the overall responsibility for all these activities who we look into or observe the changes, what is happening, looking at especially the warning and the surveillance what is happening in the community and look into should track the numbers and see should expect how many numbers can come should identify information what is required from various sources we should uh, promote reporting of unusual healthcare events by the healthcare workers and implement data collection and reporting mechanism as per whatever the guidelines are there 
follow all the standard case definitions as recommended, which we saw in the previous section. We should ensure that uh, the hospital clinicians or the frontline workers or uh, the relevant decision makers get all these information because they are going to be the, the warriors in the front line who are going to tackle when the patient surge is going to happen. So we need to keep them informed that what could be the probable cases which are coming. We should also ensure testing of persons who are hospitalized or the, based on the definition which we have seen earlier. Now, communication. This is a very important because if you do not communicate properly, then there is going to be a chaos. So accurate and timely communication is necessary to ensure for informed decision making. Uh, we should call uh, effect. We should have an effective collaboration and cooperation with the public and other trust should provide uh, awareness and we should also communicate with the, all the stakeholders, maybe the government or your uh, fellow uh, what do you call the other sister concern hospitals or something like that. So communication is very important and it should be very clear. So we should have as a hospital, we should have a mechanism for communication and you should streamline how you can share this information between the administrators or the departments or the clinicians or any other healthcare facility staff, anybody. So hospital staff, uh, uh, so you should communicate the all the uh, stakeholders in the hospital, what are their roles and responsibilities in managing the COVID-19. Ensure that all decisions on clinical triage, patient prioritization, infection prevention control and policy related things are communicated to the relevant staff appropriately and all the stakeholders. And whatever necessary information is required, we should collect, ensure collection, processing and reporting of information to supervising stakeholders. It could be the public health authorities. Suppose if the private hospitals are involved or even, uh, even the government hospital should uh, report to the respective higher authorities about what is happening. And it may be you should communicate to the neighboring hospitals or to the private practitioners or somebody who is working on pre-hospital care networks give uh, you should uh, information in the entire hospital should be disseminated draft in advance all the key messages uh, which related to covid 19 and uh, to the disseminate this to the audience or to who are patient visitor staff and have uh, sign boards everywhere appoint it's always better to appoint a uh, spokesperson who would coordinate with the community uh, with the media and health authorities. Ensure that we have a reliable, sustainable primary backup for communication systems. Now, logistic management and supplies, very important. Without the supplies, we will not be able to give a comprehensive quality care to people who are suffering from COVID-19. So we should ensure that we have all supplies, have enough MOUs with the relevant uh, suppliers, uh, especially all the consumption equipment, essential equipment, pharmaceuticals. We need uh, timely. Sometimes you may uh, get out of stock, so ensure that you get the stock immediately. So have a contingency plan uh, for everything. Not only that, uh, we need to use our hospital space very efficiently. So whenever you uh, procure these kind of uh, materials or consumables, Identify a proper space, a physical space in the hospital, have enough storage, stock, uh, enough supplies. Okay, and these uh, storage, it should be in such a place that it is easily accessible when required. So keep it in such secure place where you have a ambient temperature, good ventilation and light is available. So have enough pharmaceuticals, stock enough uh, drugs or uh, materials, whatever is required for it. Laboratory services is very crucial now in the present situation. We should maintain all the essential laboratory services which is necessary for us and for appropriate clinical management. Uh, either for both those who are uh, suffering with COVID-19 or for the other patients. Okay, uh, so we should ensure the availability of basic testing facility, uh, whatever uh, biochemistry or pathological examination. We should identify and procure all the lab supplies and resources which are uh, required and ensure that these are continuously available. 
and we should also have a backup uh, plan for uh, the laboratory identify back uh, laboratory personnel and alternative laboratory services because as the search increases we may need to do a uh, lot of different management based on the surveillance uh, information what you get now prioritize the testing for respiratory viruses according to the clinical requirements because uh, earlier we have discussed because who should be tested and whom uh, who not should be tested we should have a uh, in the lab we should have a referral pathway for identification of confirmed cases and monitoring those cases i have enough training so the government of india now that was for the hospital administrator now let's look at each area now suppose it's in outpatient facilities or initial triage maybe a consultation room the healthcare workers who will be there or doctors and nurses should ensure that physical examination of patient with these are their roles uh, of these uh, healthcare workers they should, they should ensure the physical examination of patients with respiratory symptoms inventory of ppes medicines hand washing and sanitizer facilities so and and the cleaners also will be there so with this after and between consultation it needs to be cleaned and disinfected in waiting room should be well ventilated area with exhaust fan or open windows now if it's an emergency uh, area room or inpatient facility or an isolation room or any duty station ensure that there is enough ppe drugs and disposable materials whatever is required consumables oxygen apparatus suction machine hand washing and hand sanitizer facilities so again cleaners <coughs> and while we are entering the room ensure that there is uh, they should get cleaned and they come and uh, they should have proper ppe so laboratory technicians will collect respiratory samples administrative areas all staff including healthcare workers they they will have administrative tasks to do and should not involve contact with covid 19 patients but work on logistics and supply and record maintenance hand washing and hand sanitizer facilities should be there in icu facilities especially the respiratory specialist or anesthesiologist icu nurses and ot technicians will be there they should have enough ppe they should have knowledge and skill as per the protocol they should have uh, oxygen supply emergency medicines ensure that there is monitors defibrillators and ventilators now you may have to transfer patients or shift patients to higher centers or vice versa uh, so healthcare workers will be there those who are involved in transporting suspected covid-19 patients and and you may have to referral to higher centers so drivers and paramedical staff will be involved so when they have involved uh, involve the driving the patient with suspected covid-19 disease the driver's compartment must be separated from the main compartment while assisting in embarkation or disembarkation of patient of covid-19 we need to take care of all the staff use appropriate ppe these are the references thank you uh, we can take any questions if they are available so the first question is can we take uh, hydroxychloroquine sulfate tablets directly without seeking no so the uh, answer is yeah i would request uh, dr babita to answer this question as uh, you would have heard or read from many articles or any many scientific videos hydroxychloroquine uh, we don't prefer uh, without seeking any advice uh, from the doctors because these tablets are actually given to those arthritis patient and those immuno compromised patients so i would because it has a lot of side effects so to treat the side effects another set of drugs you will be required is preferable not to uh, take even it's not necessary even we as a health personnel do not take it up so i think simple advice is not to take it so the next question what we have received is uh, what if suspect or a patient does not know how they came in contact with the disease or any person with the disease whenever the patient does not know so it is the, the responsibility of the person who is collecting information to probe further so you ask all the relevant information or what event has happened and in that way you can uh, identify whether they got in touch because everybody do not know whether the person is uh, uh, suspected or infected person okay so we need to take precautions while we are asking the questions 
this is very very important and the other question is what is the reason many doctors are getting infected even after using ppe uh, it's a good question to ask uh, not necessarily let's see there are many other uh, surfaces that we all come in contact the first foremost will be our mobiles the table surfaces so we do not know where do we come in touch in contact with so probably after doffing of the pp there could be possible chance of holding on to any rails or chairs anything can be you, you never know that is why after any after every single patient care the staff are responsible to surface disinfect each and every area possible including the door knobs the staircase rails so as per the hours of shifts of the staff worker so that's how people contract and you never know when they didn't uh, wear the mask also they cannot they could have contracted the infection from outside you never know so probably that's what we find more number of health workers and the cases are also increasing plus there are um, there are incidents where there are not enough pp supplies we never know what's actual uh cause of where what is happening with the uh, health workers why are they contracting so often so probably these are the reasons which i could understand so i hope i have answered your question okay we have other uh, three questions is there a vaccine for novel corona virus think answer is no as of now we don't have any vaccine uh is there a treatment for novel corona virus again answer is no at present we don't have a specific treatment it's a conservative treatment which is happening are the health workers at risk of novel corona virus yes all health workers are at risk that is why we insist that they should have a ppe when they are going in uh, in their respective work area so my take home message even now to all the listeners and maybe their friends colleagues you can share it is Let's remember remember. sanitize that is hand washing or alcohol rub wear mask and social distancing which plays a huge role no matter whether you are in higher cadre of uh, profession or even a housewife or a layman or a uh, person who do not have any home it could be a migrant worker also so we, we do not know how do we contract how whom do we contact on a daily basis so let's stick to one one person policy like if at all somebody is going uh, to buy groceries let it be one person whoever is going for work they are forced to go work uh, especially the doctors let them purchase your groceries and make minimizing the risk of them getting in contact with the community so stay home stay safe and protect yourself that will be a huge help to all of us and in terms of numbers in terms of resources thank you today's session we are coming to the conclusion that i hope you have all understood what is why we have taken up all this uh, training session in for very many of you all hope you all follow these any queries please get back and these videos will be shared in near future to uh, we see rhs youtube so you can follow through that and many of the websites like ministry of health and family welfare also give you a lot of resource material hope you have understood whatever dr umar shankar and myself have uh, explained to you all hope have a great day and a safe stay thank you thank you